Thank you, thank you. Be seated, please. Isn't it great to be in South Carolina right now? Yes, sir. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina, as they, as they say. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the General Assembly, my fellow South Carolinians, we're here tonight to address challenges and opportunities. But first, as in prior years, I'd like to recognize those in uniform whom we lost in the line of duty. Lance Corporal Melton Fox Gore of the Horry County Police Department, Chief William Edward Eddie McNeil Jr. of the Campobello Fire Department, and Lieutenant John Stewart of the Lake City Police Department. To the families and loved ones of these men, with all our hearts, we offer our condolences. We are eternally grateful for their service. 33 South Carolinians have received the Medal of Honor since it was created more than 150 years ago. That medal, as you know, requires nominees to receive presidential approval before it is granted and is given to those who distinguish themselves, quote, conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Two South Carolinians were recently awarded the Medal of Honor. Sergeant Major Thomas Patrick Payne, who now serves in the Army Special Operations Command as an instructor, was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions during a hostage rescue mission in an area of northern Iraq controlled by the Islamic State. A graduate of Lugolf Elgin High School, and a veteran of 17 combat deployments, Sergeant Major, Major Payne has also received multiple other combat decorations, including the Bronze Star Medals for both valor and service and the Purple Heart. He and his wife, Allison, have three children and live in South Carolina. Christopher Andrew Solis was a sergeant first class in the Army and a graduate of the Citadel before he enlisting in the Army in 2007. Sergeant First Class Solis was killed on his fifth deployment when he willingly exposed himself to heavy enemy fire to direct and lead a medical helicopter evacuation of wounded troops. A native of Somerville, Sergeant First Class Solis was also awarded, in addition to the Medal of Honor, the Bronze Broad, Broad Star Medal, and the Meritorious Service Medal. The sacrifices these two men made in service of their country and fellow soldiers are difficult for us to comprehend. Their bravery in the face of imminent danger should inspire us all. <clears throat> we are honored to have Sergeant Major Payne and his wife Allison, along with Sergeant First Class Salise's wife, Ms. K.T. Salise, and their daughter Shannon, here with us tonight. Though we will never be able to adequately show our appreciation for what they have done for us and their country, I would humbly ask them to stand and give us the opportunity to do the best we can now. Will you please stand? Thank you. Thank you. Also delighted to have with us once again tonight our First Lady, my bride Peggy, our son Henry Jr. and his wife Virginia, also our daughter Mary Rogers and her husband Sam. Please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Also, we're pleased to have with us tonight our Lieutenant Governor Pamela Ebbett and her husband David. Will you please stand?
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, South Carolina is booming. People from all over the world are visiting and falling in love with our state. Employers are creating new jobs, entrepreneurs are opening new businesses, and companies are deciding to relocate here. Our businesses and family-friendly environment has produced historic gains in new jobs, capital investment, and population growth. Since January of 2017, we have announced 58,803 new jobs with over $17 billion in new capital investment in the Palmetto State. In the last 12 months, we've announced 15,000 new jobs and $4.3 billion in new capital investment. As of November 2021, there were 18,000 more South Carolinians employed than there were in February 2020. Our gross domestic product increased 10% during the COVID-19 pandemic and has increased 25% over the past, past five years. The state's unemployment rate remains well below the national average and has improved every month of 2021, dropping from 5.6% in November 2020 to 3.7% in November 2021. The 2020 U.S. Census data shows that South Carolina is the 10th fastest growing state in the nation. I extend hearty thanks to all here tonight and those who have gone before as well for the excellent stewardship which has brought us to this day today. For now, we have opportunity like we have never seen before. Our new Secretary of Commerce, Harry Leipzig, is here tonight. He's a man of vision and accomplishment. Every indication is that this year, 2022, will even be better than last year for Team South Carolina's economic recruitment successes. Welcome, Secretary Leipzig. Please stand and be recognized. In the last year, we announced numerous transformative economic development victories. Some are represented here tonight by people. In Spartanburg, Oshkosh Defense will invest $155 million and will employ more than 1,000 upstate residents to manufacture the Postal Service's new fleet of electric mail trucks that will replace the nation's current fleet of combustion engine mail trucks. Welcome to Mr. Don Bent, Chief Operating Officer of Oshkosh Defense. Mr. Bent. There's more. In Chester County, the Ernest and Julio Gallo Winery will locate their only bottling, bottling and cannery facility outside of California with a $423 million investment and almost 500 new jobs. Welcome, Mr. Steen, excuse me, Mr. Stein Edwards, Senior Director of Operations for Gallo Winery. Mr. Stein. Thank you, sir. There's more. In Edgefield County, Generac Power Systems will construct a new facility to manufacture commercial and residential power generators and has already announced an expansion. These projects will create a combined 750 new jobs. Welcome Mr. Tom Pettit, Chief Operations Officer, and Mr. Steve Androjack, Senior Director of Operations. Will you please stand? Welcome. Thank you. Walmart continues to invest in South Carolina with the construction of a new distribution center in Spartanburg with a $450 million investment, creating more than 400 new jobs. Welcome, Mr. Jeff Holzbauer, General Manager, Walmart Import and Logistics. In Kershaw County, Prestige Farms will open an agribusiness processing and cannery facility investing $150 million and creating almost 300 new jobs. 
welcome Mr. Zach Prestige of Prestige Farms. And that's all for now, but there will be plenty more. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many states shuttered their economies, closed businesses, and enacted draconian restrictions, many of which continue to this very day. We took a better approach. We never closed. Through our reasonable steps of limited, measured, and temporary actions, we've been able to combat the virus without crippling our economy. Also, by being careful and conservative and freezing new spending in 2020, not only did we avoid cutting services, raising taxes, or borrowing money, we saw our state's booming economy create a large amount of new surplus revenues in 2021. Compare this, for example, to some other states. New York, where there are 476,000 fewer people employed now than in February 2020. The New York state unemployment rate is third highest in the country and 2.7% higher than it was in February 2022. Or compared to Michigan, where the unemployment rate in November 2021 was 5.9% and the ninth highest in the country. More Americans moved out of Michigan during the pandemic than nearly any other state in our nation. Today, South Carolina state government, however, is in the strongest fiscal condition ever. We have the largest budget surplus, the largest rainy day reserve account balance, and the lowest debt in our history. However, however, South Carolina is facing a new challenge, an unusual challenge. The dangerous, irresponsible, and sometimes unconstitutional behavior of our own federal government. While we and other states have differed with the federal authorities before, this last year has been alarming and unprecedented. On his first day in office, President Biden canceled the immigration policies established by President Trump and halted construction of the border wall, thus sur surrendering our own nation's sovereignty and security to millions of illegal and undocumented immigrants, including human traffickers, drug dealers, and foreign agents who have freely crossed our southern uh, southwestern border. The resulting lawlessness and chaos required us in this state and others to deploy troops from the South Carolina National Guard to defend these borders and to protect our state and others from the danger posed by cartels and traffickers of all kinds. I traveled to the border myself to visit our troops and Border Patrol agents. I saw the challenges. They were steep. The Biden administration and many in the media have turned their backs on these brave men and women, but South Carolina will not. <clears throat> we always answer the call for help, and we always step into the breach. We will carry the banner of freedom high even if the federal government walks away. We have and we will. The Biden administration also took aim at South Carolina's pro-life and pro-family policies. They challenged my policy of preventing taxpayer dollars from going to abortion providers like Planned Parenthood, which sued to overturn our heartbeat law and to stop the state from protecting the most precious right of all, the right to life. They attacked South Carolina's faith-based foster care providers like Miracle Hill, despite a recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling that upheld the right of faith-based foster care providers who choose to work with parents holding similar religious beliefs. They even canceled South Carolina's requirement that Medicaid recipients must work, volunteer, or attend school to receive benefits, while at the same time the Biden administration was paying people on unemployment to stay at home rather than return to work or get a job. President Biden and his liberal allies sued to force South Carolina to adopt universal mask mandates in public schools despite clear constitutional authority to the contrary. And finally, the Biden administration has illegally attempted to impose 
vaccine mandates on private citizens all across the country in clear violation of constitutional authority and of common sense. Thankfully, President Biden seems to have been about as successful in defending his mandates in court as he has been in selling them across the country to the American people. But despite this barrage of unwarranted challenges, we will continue to grow and prosper in South Carolina. We will not let the federal government violate the Constitution and dictate decisions that rightly belong to South Carolina and her people. We will fight to defend the rule of law, preserve our state's sovereignty, and reject efforts to destroy individual liberty. A determined war in our effort is with us tonight. Attorney General Allen Wilson. Allen Wilson, will you please stand and be recognized? General Wilson. I sometimes think our friends in the federal establishment forget that it was the states which created the national government and gave it limited authority and not the other way around. As you're aware, the Accelerate SC Task Force has played a vital role in the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. That task force is comprised of volunteers from every sector of our state's economy along with officials from state and local agencies and organizations. Almost two years ago now, the Accelerate SC Task Force produced recommendations which guided us in taking very targeted and limited measures to combat the spread of the Corona-19 virus without shutting down our state's economy. In addition, Accelerate SC conducted a thorough and complete review of the Federal CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan for the purpose of providing expenditure recommendations to my office, which they did. I believe that Accelerate SC is the model for collaboration, cooperation, and communication between the government and the private sector. And on behalf of our entire state, I thank them for their extraordinary service and accomplishments. Tonight, we have the leaders of this remarkable effort with us. Former Senator Greg Ryberg served as chairman, and Mr. James Burns served as executive director. Thank you for your service. Will you please stand and be recognized? South Carolina's booming economy, with almost $3 billion in surplus revenue, along with $2.4 billion in ARPA funds, present us with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We know that the competition for jobs and investment is fierce, particularly around the Southeast, nationally and globally. We cannot be complacent. We must act. We must make big, bold, and transformative investments in the areas of education, infrastructure, workforce, economic development to strengthen the foundations of our prosperity for generations to come. For the second time, second year in a row, my executive budget places $500 million into our state's rainy day reserve fund. By saving this money instead of spending it, something that served our state well last year, we will double the size of our reserves and we will be prepared for any future economic uncertainties should they arise. I ask that the General Assembly consider maintaining a minimum balance in the rainy day reserve fund equal to 10% of the total amount of funds available to be appropriated in any year. That will keep us safe. Despite our great successes, South Carolina's marginal income tax rate of 7% is the highest in the Southeast where most of the competition is and the 12th highest in the nation. For example, <clears throat> Tennessee and Florida have no income tax at all. Louisiana is at 6%. Arkansas, 5.9%. Missouri, 5.4%. Georgia and Virginia are both at 5.75%. North Carolina is at 5.25 and has just passed legislation to cut it again. Alabama, Mississippi, and Kentucky are at 5%. 
These are our competitors. This makes South Carolina less competitive for new jobs and capital investment. This year marks the fourth year that I have proposed a 1% rate reduction over five years on all personal income tax brackets, starting with an immediate $177 million cut. A tax cut has the impact of a pay raise and more money in the pockets of our people to spend is a catalyst for even more economic growth and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, we have almost $1 billion in surplus recurring revenue available for this state budget. Our state's booming economy will likely create more. Our work will not be done this session unless I am able to sign from you an income tax into law. We must also re-examine those issues, practices, and laws that make our state less competitive and make it difficult for our businesses and entrepreneurs to invest, grow, and thrive. One issue in need of re-examination is the area of civil litigation known as joint and several liability. Business owners should not be penalized for the actions of others simply because they have money nor should they be absolved of their actions. We can find a balance that provides the opportunity for justice without damaging our economy, I am confident. There's no, more, there was no infrastructure more in need of big, bold, and transformative one-time investment than our state's roads, bridges, highways, and interstates. Our booming economy and rapid population growth have outpaced the state's ability to keep up with improvements to our transportation infrastructure. We see it every day. Utilizing a combination of $660 million in federal ARPA funds and $600 million from surplus, surplus revenue, I'm recommending to you, the General Assembly, that you provide no less than $1.26 billion to the Department of Transportation to accelerate construction, expansion, or improvements to our state-owned roads, bridges, highways, and interstates. This one-time investment of over a billion dollars will allow the Department of Transportation to accelerate the start and completion of some of their highest priority projects. Projects such as the widening of I-26 to six lanes between Columbia and Charleston, the widening of Interstate 95 to six lanes in the Low Country, lane widening on Interstate 85 in the Upstate, and the long-awaited start of construction on I-73 from the PD to the Grand Strand. In addition, DOT will have sufficient state matching funds from this to apply for an additional $250 million in federal funds each year for the next five years. These federal matching funds will allow the DOT to expedite completion of local and regional projects designed to relieve traffic congestion, to repair, repair or replace over 400 bridges, and to enhance repaving and resurfacing on our local and secondary roads. Three years ago, on the south steps of the State House, you'll remember I pledged that we would work together as a team, and we have. I propose that we make bold reforms for K-12 education in South Carolina so that every student, every student, is ready to learn when he or she enters the classroom, and that the words corridor of shame would soon become a fading memory. I propose that we unleash the free market and expand access to full-day kindergarten for every lower income four-year-old child in our state. Parents should be able to choose the public, private, or for-profit child care provider that best suits their needs and their child's educational needs. Today, we have fully funded four-day, full-day, four-year-old kindergarten programs for every Medicaid-eligible child in the state. That is excellent. As a result, the Education Oversight Committee reports that the 4K enrollment has increased 47%, or by 4,600 children, as a result of that. 
There are 50 new private, nonprofit, and faith-based providers who have opened 66 new 4K classrooms in our public, and in our public schools there are 120 new 4K classrooms. In a recent survey by First Steps, two out of three parents reported that enrolling their children in First Steps 4K also allowed them to go to work or continue their own education. We know that parents in South Carolina must be confident that their children are safe and secure when they go to school. The presence of a certified law enforcement school resource officer in every school is more important now than ever. We must also recognize that a mental health crisis exists in South Carolina. I say a mental health crisis exists in South Carolina, especially among our young people who have weathered two years now of disruptions, virtual instruction, isolation, and constant changes to normal routines. They cannot handle it. The crisis is here right now. Students must have access to professional mental care, counseling, and services. Because 60% of South Carolina children are served by Medicaid, I've directed Health and Human Service Director Robbie Kerr to initiate an immediate review of our state's behavioral health funding and delivery system. Time is of the essence. We must do better. The cost of doing nothing for these children is unimaginable, and the damage, well, the damage likely will be immeasurable. We must act. South Carolina's system of state-run treatment programs and facilities need a modern-day refreshment, reevaluation, and reinvention. I also suggest to members of the General Assembly that the time has come to evaluate whether the state should privatize, privatize behavioral health services currently provided by the top Department of Mental Health. When the Education Finance Act of 1977 was signed into law, there were only three line item appropriations for 4K education. Today, there are approximately 29. This 44-year-old funding system is archaic, confusing, and inadequate. The way we fund K-12 education must be simplified, and it must be transparent and accountable. State funds must follow students directly to where? To the classroom. School districts must be held accountable for how they spend the taxpayers' money and graded on their results. I have proposed that funds for K-12 education be appropriated in a manner that is easy and simple to understand. School districts will receive the funds necessary to support an average ratio of 11.7 students per teacher with an average salary of $66,524, including benefits. In exchange, every school district must disclose how they spend every dollar, be it local, state, or federal. This information must be published online by the State Department of Education. Why? So that students and taxpayers will know where their money is being spent. Is it being spent in the classroom? Is it being spent on administration? Is it being spent on overhead? Or is it being spent somewhere else? They need to know. My executive budget also raises the minimum salary for a starting teacher from $35,000 to $38,000. We have made progress in raising teacher pay. Just five years ago, the minimum salary for a brand new teacher was $30,113. Today, <laughs> we know how important our teachers are. They are critical. Today, we have the 2022 South Carolina Teacher of the Year with us. Ms. Amy Carter is an English teacher from Chapin High School and is here representing our state's classroom teachers. We're also joined by the superintendent of Kershaw County School District, Dr. Shane Robbins. Dr. Robbins' innovative leadership helped guide his school district through the pandemic with minimal disruption to the classroom, remaining open for full-time instruction throughout the pandemic. 
Ms. Carter, Dr. Robbins, please stand and let us recognize you. Charter schools in our state have seen explosive growth in both enrollment and demand. <clears throat> Excuse me. The South Carolina Public Charter School District and the Charter Institute at Erskine are expected to authorize a total of 67 charter schools for the school year starting in August. My executive budget provides an additional $60.2 million to meet the growing demand of parents seeking new educational opportunities and in-person classroom instruction for their children. In addition, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm proposing $20 million be used to create education savings accounts, by, which by the way have been available to parents in red and blue states for many years. Although some may say otherwise, we know that parents know what's best for their children. They know the type of education environment and instruction that works best for their own children's unique needs. Speaking of parents, I believe we need more parental involvement in the classroom, not less. You may have been as surprised as I was not long ago when the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Merrick Garland, instructed the FBI to begin investigating parents who attend school board meetings. I'm not making that up, you'll, you'll remember that. In the annals of dangerous ideas, that one takes the cake. And so did assertions that, and I quote, and you heard them, parents have no business telling schools what they should teach, end of quote. Parents have every right to express their concerns to a teacher, to a principal, to members of the school board, or anybody else. In fact, that is their duty. <laughs> Recently, a group of concerned parents contacted my office about a book containing age-inappropriate sexually explicit, obscene, and pornographic images, which was available in their school's library for young students. If school personnel had performed even a cursory review in this instance, I believe it would have revealed that this book contains sexually explicit and pornographic depictions which easily meet or exceed the statutory definition of obscenity. For explicit materials of the nature of that particular book, and there may be others, to have been introduced or allowed into a South Carolina school without oversight, without public review, and without parents' prior knowledge is highly troubling and destroys public confidence in our public schools. Parents must know what their children are hearing, seeing, and learning in the classroom every day. It's their right and their duty. <clears throat> South Carolina, like every other state in the country, is facing an historic labor crisis. It has affected every sector of our economy. With 100,000 open jobs, there's a paycheck awaiting anyone willing to work in South Carolina. I'd like to share with you an innovative public-private initiative designed to fill those open jobs here in South Carolina. South Carolina Future Makers is a first-in-the-nation program that connects students and individuals with internship, apprenticeship, and career opportunities throughout the state. South Carolina Future Makers has reached virtually every high school is available to all 16 technical colleges and is now engaging our state's military community to connect our servicemen and women with the many opportunities available in South Carolina. This innovative approach is using technology to advance connectivity throughout our state, it is a valuable resource for addressing our workforce needs. In addition, 
To fill those open jobs, I'm requesting a General Assembly invest $124 million to expand workforce scholarships for the future, a program that allows residents to earn an industry credential or an associate degree in high demand careers, careers in manufacturing, healthcare, computer science, information technology, transportation, logistics, or construction, and more. We know this program works. Last year, we partnered with the South Carolina Technical College System to create these scholarships, and we dedicated $29 million in federal relief funds to start the program. In that short period, over 5,000 South Carolinians have been retrained and employed. For example, <clears throat> the program produced the following, 485 nursing, uh, assistants, 283 commercial truck drivers, 253 EMTs, 239 welders, 235 phlebotomists, 177 received IT certifications, 130 received South Carolina manufacturing certification, 79 certified as forklift operators, and 61 certified as heavy equipment operators. That is good news. In fact, we have a few of these students with us tonight in the balcony. I will ask them to rise in a minute. Let me tell you the stories first. Lillian Cruz, 25 years old, grew up in Indiana. Justin Smith, 25, grew up in Georgia. Now they live in Clemson. Both were raised by parents who did not complete high school. They enlisted in the Marine Corps after high school. They met while they were stationed in Japan. After completing their service, they began taking classes at Tri-County Technical College. Lillian's goal was to become an architect, and Justin's was to own his own business. When the pandemic hit and classes went online, they went to work instead. However, online classes didn't work for them. Justin was making 18 dollars an hour and Lillian was making 16 an hour. Neither of them enjoyed the work or the pay. They hoped to find a new and better opportunity and they did. Last month, Liliana and Justin completed the five-week commercial truck driving program at Tri-County Tech. Before they finished, they were offered a job driving as a team for Snyder National. Now they have a combined salary of $140,000. How about that? <laughs> There's more. Tasha Frazier of Sumter went through the Certified Nursing Assistant Program at Central Carolina Technical College. Y'all, our technical colleges are gold mines. She successfully earned her accreditation and was immediately offered a job with McLeod Health in Manning. William Westbrook lives in Graniteville and had worked for many years as a local chemical company. He was laid off in 2019 and continued to look for work. He enrolled at Aiken Technical College after learning about these scholarships and obtained his manufacturing certification at no cost. William was hired immediately after graduation by Central States Manufacturing. I'd also like to recognize Dr. Tim Hardy, the president of the South Carolina Technical College System, who is with us tonight. Dr. Hardy and his staff worked with us and the 16 technical colleges to successfully implement this wonderful program. Some of the presidents of the co those colleges are here also with their former students. Dr. Galen DeHay, president of the, of the Tri-County Technical College. Dr. Kevin Pollock, president of Central Carolina Technical College. Dr. Forrest Mahan, president of Aiken Technical College. Thank you all for being with us tonight. I would ask that you all, including these successful students, to please stand and be recognized.
Access and affordability to higher education are essential to ensure that our state has the trained and skilled workforce to compete for jobs and investment in the future. That means higher education, our colleges, universities, and technical colleges must be accessible and affordable for the sons and daughters of South Carolina. Once again, my executive budget freezes college tuition for in-state students in exchange for an indexed appropriation based on the number of in-state students enrolled at each public institution. Funds for deferred maintenance are also distributed pro rata and based on a school's in-state enrollment. Also, every South Carolina resident who qualifies for a federal Pell Grant will be eligible for 100% of their tuition to be paid for with a grant at any in-state public college, university, or technical college. The college transition program was created for students with intellectual disabilities as they transition from high school into college and eventually into the workforce. The program teaches students how to learn independently, how to maintain employment, and how to live self-sufficiently. This year, I am proposing that we invest an additional $4.3 million in lottery proceeds, proceeds to enhance scholarships for the college transition programs, which are offered at Clemson, Coastal Carolina, the College of Charleston, the University of South Carolina, and Winthrop University. I have been there and have seen them. You will be thrilled to see them yourself. Tonight, we are joined by two students from the college transition program, Michael Harmon from Carolina Life and Hunter Hopkins from Clemson Life. Gentlemen, please stand, if you will, and be recognized. Thank you. In rural South Carolina, water and sewer is the key to life, good public health, economic health. It's a key to the community's entire health. The right water and sewer assets in a county can transform a tax base, we know. That means jobs, good schools, strong families, and a safe and vibrant community. The state's rural water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure is becoming old and outdated. Many of these systems have exceeded their useful life quite clearly, and some are barely hanging on. I have proposed that we use $500 million in federal funds to transform these water, sewer, and stormwater systems in our state's poorest counties to upgrade or replace deficient rural water and wastewater systems and to incentivize large systems to connect with smaller and faltering systems. How about broadband? In recent years, facilitating access to broadband connectivity has become a top priority for South Carolina. From health care to education, more people are working or hearing or learning from home. Quality internet service has quickly become not a luxury but a necessity for the prosperity of our state and our people. I ask that the General Assembly appropriate an additional $400 million in federal funds for the state's broadband infrastructure program being overseen by the Office of Regulatory Staff. Can you imagine what our people could do if we were all connected by broadband? The good Lord has richly breathed South Carolina from the mountains to the seas. Our pristine coastline is a major economic driver for the state as well as a source of beauty and happiness. If you stretch it out, it's roughly 2,376 miles long with approximately 200 miles of direct beachfront. The coastline contains several ecosystems, including marshlands, estuaries, barrier islands, tidal creeks, and beaches. The state's 35 barrier islands and the surrounding marshes are natural mechanisms for absorbing energy flooding and storm surge. Three years ago, I issued an executive order creating the South Carolina Floodwater Commission, a collaborative effort 
charged with providing short and long-term recommendations to alleviate and mitigate the impact of flooding. One recommendation was for the governor to appoint a chief resilience officer to lead a new state resilience office. Last year, I had the honor of appointing Mr. Ben Duncan, who is serving as the director of the Disaster Recovery Office as South Carolina's first chief resilience officer. At the time, South Carolina was one of a handful of states with a chief resilience officer. Mr. Duncan is here with us tonight. Mr. Duncan, will you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> to protect South Carolina's abundant natural resources, I'm proposing the General Assembly provide the State Office of Resilience with $300 million in federal funds. A portion of these funds should be used to complete the construction of homes in the PD that were destroyed by Hurricane Florence, as well as completing green stormwater mitigation projects throughout the rest of the state. In addition, I'm recommending that the office identify pristine coastal properties and tracts where public access may be in jeopardy of being lost are destroyed by flooding, erosion, or storm damage. Also, these funds should be used for a complete remediation and removal of hazardous materials from the hull of the USS Yorktown, including hundreds of thousands of gallons of old petroleum, polluted ballast waters, and polychlorinated bifenol compounds, also known as PCBs, that were not removed from the ship's 428 vessel tanks and compartments by the Navy. It's still there. I can think of no more meritorious use of taxpayer funds than to protect our pristine natural resources for future generations of South Carolinians. Ports, with the opening of the new UK Leatherman Terminal in North Charleston, the Port of Charleston is no longer the only major container port on the east coast of the United States without significant near dock rail access. The new Navy base intermodal container transfer facility will provide near dock dual rail access for both Norfolk Southern and CSX railways, allowing for the movement of goods and commerce throughout the United States even better than before. In 2021, the General Assembly appropriated $200 million towards the $500 million cost of construction. My executive budget proposes $300 million to complete this restructuring on time and debt-free. Tonight, we have the CEO of the South Carolina Ports Authority with us, Mr. Jim Newsom. As you know, Mr. Jim is retiring this year. I ask that you join me in thanking Mr. Newsom for providing the port and our state with years of exceptional leadership and vision. Mr. Newsom, you will be missed. Will you please stand and be recognized? Ladies and gentlemen, to keep our people safe, we must maintain a robust law enforcement presence and properly fund the police. I believe we have the finest law enforcement establishment in the country, but we're growing. We must keep our people safe or they can't prosper. Our state law enforcement agencies continue to lose valuable and experienced personnel because they're unable to remain competitive in pay and benefits. My executive budget dedicates $31 million in new dollars to law enforcement, public safety, and first response agencies for recruitment and retention pay raises. We must also keep our law enforcement officers safe while they're on the job. My executive budget again proposes providing $21 million 
for the grants to law enforcement agencies for additional body cameras and bulletproof vests. I ask you to think for a minute. Most of us get up in the morning and put on a shirt or a tie or a blouse and go to work, but these officers strap on a bulletproof vest in the morning. Why do they do that? It's so they won't get killed when they get shot. Now, those people are protecting us, and we need to stand with them every time. Thank you. And once again, once again, I'm calling on the General Assembly to eliminate all state income taxes on the retirement pay of career military veterans and on South Carolina law enforcement officers, firefighters, and peace officers. Many states have already done this, and I promise you the decision makers at the Department of Defense notice a lot of things, and they take note of these things or the lack of, in of action when they make decisions on base closures, realignment, and new missions for America's military installations. Our military installations, and we have eight major ones, and the Coast Guard is adding strength in Charleston, but they are all at risk like all of the others in the country. I believe we can do it better than they can anywhere else, but we have to show them. It is past time for the General Assembly to act on this issue before it is too late. Our booming economy and record low employment sometimes place state agencies at a disadvantage with the private sector when they are recruiting or retaining the best employees. I believe the question of state employee compensation needs reexamination. Across the board, pay raises for state employees are less effective than those based on performance, merit, success, or longevity. Agency directors should be empowered to incentivize their personnel. My executive budget takes the $46.6 million, which would equal a 2% across the board pay raise, and directs that those same funds be used instead for merit-based pay raises. However, each agency must submit their merit-based pay raise plan to the Department of Administration's Division of Human Resources for review and approval to ensure that the raises awarded consistently across state government and are in accordance with official policies and procedures. As for our pension plan, we've heard the alarm bell for years. With inaction, it doesn't get better, it gets louder every year. The longer we wait, the harder it will be to fix our pension system's huge unfunded liability. So once again, I'm asking that we, at the end of this year, close enrollment in the current defined benefit plan. Putting money into this retirement system today is like trying to fill a bathtub with the drain open. We must close enrollment first. The best answer is a date certain transition away from defined benefit pension plans to defined contribution plans for new state employees. But of course, of course, we must maintain our commitment to retired South Carolinians who retire on income from the pension plan. It is time to act. The right to vote is the single most important right protected by the United States Constitution. 
However, in 2020, we learned that our state's election laws were not being applied properly and consistently across the state by county election officials. Speaker Jay Lucas has sponsored legislation to standardize and ensure the uniform and legal conduct of elections in all 46 counties. In addition, my executive budget proposes creating a new election integrity and compliance audit program at the State Election Commission. Teams of auditors working with the state, for the state, will conduct regular and routine examinations to confirm the integrity of elections conducted on the state and local level. Send these election reforms to my desk and I will be happy to sign them into law. <laughs> Ethics. Ethics are always a question. To maintain the public's confidence in their elected representatives at all levels of government, we must expand the resources and authority of the State Ethics Commission and the Office of the Inspector General. Ladies and gentlemen, when the people lose confidence in the elections, all is lost. The public should know if their tax dollars are me being spent properly by the recipients, like a school district or nonprofit organization. The public should also know who's getting paid to influence decisions by county, municipal, or school board officials. These paid advocates, people paid to be there to advocate for a cause or an issue, should be required to register with the State Ethics Commission as lobbyists, just like everybody else who's paid to lobby the legislature. What is good for the State House, what has worked for the State House, is good for the courthouse as well. In the last decade, we have consistently seen ethical issues arise surrounding some of our state's 46 county sheriffs. I have proposed that the Law Enforcement Training Council at the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy develop and conduct annual ethics training for every county sheriff. That will help restore confidence as well. <clears throat> I always enjoy, I always enjoy coming to these sessions, and this is the fifth one I've been to. I hope to come to some more. <laughs> but it's always great to see everybody here. And I tell you, we, y'all, we are, we're on the way up. We are on the way up. And we, I want to compliment you again for many hard-fought battles to come to the right conclusion to get the right things done for the people of this state. I'm proud of our people, and I'm proud of you. When I go around the country, I'm always very proud to be introduced as the governor from the great state of South Carolina. I just, I think I stand the speaker an inch or two taller every time I, I hear those words, because I'm proud of us. I'm often introduced as the 117th governor of the great state of South Carolina. What is interesting is that other governors, when they're introduced, they may be the 23rd governor of Arizona, or the 40th governor of California, or the 48th governor of Kansas, or something like that. It makes you think. It makes me think every time. Our state was one of the original 13 colonies on the Atlantic seaboard there, except Pennsylvania didn't quite touch the seaboard, but came close one of the 13 colonies that produced the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Those other states weren't here. And one of the 12 states which created and signed the United States Constitution in 1787. Our people from then until now have endured and overcome every obstacle and challenge created by man and nature. We have endured it all, we have seen it all, and we have prospered. And with that heritage, we stand today in a moment brimming with opportunity and promise unlike we've seen before. So let us seize this moment by thinking big, by being bold, by being confident, and making transformative investments in this way. I believe we will set our state on a course 
that will provide the opportunity for prosperity and success and happiness for generations of South Carolinians. Let us continue working together. Let's keep winning. I believe in South Carolina. I believe in America. And I believe in each and every one of you. I believe that the best is yet to come. I believe in the great people and the greatness of the people of South Carolina. So I say God bless the Palmetto State. God bless her extraordinary people. God bless you all. God bless America and good night.